Okay. Um, before we begin, I, I really wanted to thank Percy's for, for all of her support and for allowing us to participate here today. From the moment the first issue came out, honestly, the support she's, she's had uh, for our project and that she's shown for our project has really meant a lot and has allowed us to do what, we, what, what we've done. So thank you so much to Percy's. Um, okay, welcome to the Bitarov panel. Uh, Bitarov is a DIY independent grassroots volunteer based magazine and record label about the histories of Iran and Iranians across the globe established by a group of grown ass kids <laughs> or to be more technically precise adults who continue to maintain their youthful exuberance. Um, I am Arash Davari, I'm one of the co-founders of the project alongside many others, three of whom are seated here with you today. I'm part of the project's current editorial staff where I'm responsible for the overall conceptualization uh, and operation of things. Uh, two uh, central members of our editorial staff couldn't be here today, unfortunately. One is Golnar Nikpur, who is our production editor and uh, is responsible for the production of the things that we put out at a very logistical kind of level, day-to-day -day logistics and distribution. The other is Afsun Talai, uh, who is responsible for our visual arts and lovely graphic design work, but unfortunately they couldn't be here. Um, I am, however, pleased to present my fellow panelists uh, three out of four contributing editors, each of whom works on specific aspects of the project as it pertains to their own talents and expertise. We have, in order of appearance, Solmaz Sharif, who is responsible for our poetry series online. Uh, Mani Parcham, who was our written content editor and copy editor for issues one through three, and who is now responsible for the oral history project. And uh, Arash Saadinia, whose many talents from event planning to photography to DJing to politicking to translation are willingly offered as the project has needed it. Um, although I think his official responsibility is the poetry that goes into the pages of the magazine. Uh, what we'd like to do today is to present Bitarov to you in case you're uh, unfamiliar with it. And for those who are aware of it, uh, to open up a discussion about our experiences and motivations in producing this kind of material. We deeply and sincerely understand this project to be a collective one. Uh, one that is in progress, not just amongst ourselves, but with the broader Iranian community. And so even though I imagine we could sit up here and talk for hours about it, our hope is that the conversation will be an exchange that we have uh, with you. So we'll try to keep our presentations brief to that end. Um, before we open it up, though, uh, we will have four short presentations. Um, you're already in the midst of one of them. Uh, I'll continue to talk about the project as a whole, what it is, how we've conceptualized it, uh, how we put it together, and why we thought it was necessary to do so. Afterwards, Solmaz will speak about the language of the project, what a magazine as a rhetorical form makes possible, as well as the significance of translation as an orientation or diasporic epistemology. Uh, this will be accompanied by a reading, at, at least one or two, or some, some kind of reading. Um, third, Mani will speak about the language in the project, the process, thought, and inspiration involved in putting together an oral history section, and the editorial decisions or choices made with regards to written content. Uh, finally, Arash Saadinia will lead us in a more uh, informal roundtable first amongst us as panelists and editors, and then, inshallah, with you as part of a broader conversation. Okay, so let's get to it. Uh, as I understand it, this is a project about being the subjects of a process. Allow me to explain. Instead of producing content about the diasporic experience, content that even in the best case scenario can treat the so-called Iranian American or the Iranian diaspora as an object of analysis, the project is interested in creation and curation from a diasporic perspective, our diasporic perspective. Not what it means or what it feels like to do so, but rather quite simply to do so. As I imagine you already know, there's a treacherous line between an effort to articulate and convey to create a space for a diasporic perspective and the inadvertent objectification or reification of that perspective. So a collection of Iranian-American writers meant to give voice to an Iranian-American perspective finds purchase potentially because it allows a, a reader to peek into the Iranian-American psyche as opposed, to, uh, as opposed to seeing with the writer of a piece. We, came, we come to see the writer as they see and nothing more. 
Perhaps that's all we can hope and strive for when it comes to audiences who are not already somehow familiar with the perspective in question. But the question remains as to what we can do with audiences who are, like us, somehow already familiar with what it means to be this thing called diasporic. B. Tadoff offered an opportunity to get that conversation going amongst ourselves. But instead of only talking about it amongst ourselves, we chose to have that conversation through action, through the production of these tangible artifacts. Be Taught Off magazine actually began for me in three separate conversations with the people on this panel, with Solmas about oral histories interwoven with city maps on a website, with Mani about oral history adaptations in print form, and with Ara Saradinia about the creation of a journal. The project materialized in 2012 when we all collectively put together and published the first issue of the magazine. The magazine features roughly five different types of content. Oral histories, visual arts, nonfiction pieces, poetry, and curated archives. Each issue is organized around a the theme. Half of the content in each issue pertains to the theme, the other half is open-ended. All magazine content is published in the English language, with occasional Persian language originals published alongside translations. Okay, so what I'd like to do is to talk about the issue themes and the various components of the magazine while I go through the three issues that we've uh, put out. So, this is the cover, uh, front cover and back cover of the first issue. It was released in October of 2012. The issue theme is taught off for obvious reasons in light of our overall choice of title. Um, there's quite a, uh, quite a bit of material in the issue defining, interpreting, playing with the concept of Tadov, so I'll hold off on opening that can of worms for now. I will say, however, that when asked about the significance of the project's title, um, I tend to define B. Tadov as being authentic, cutting to the chase, keeping it real, if you will. Um, it signals an intimacy between two human beings, regardless of what, uh, regardless of what may be expected. If we consider the project then as an act of translation across an older generation of Iranian Americans and those of us raised here or across the Iranian community and those who do not identify with it, then the title represents an effort to transcend cultural particularity. But an untranslatable word like Tarof is nevertheless present in it, which, which is to suggest to achieve that transcendence with one another, we need to ground ourselves in the histories and cultures that we've inherited at times unconsciously. In the effort to do so, we initially organized Bitarov around an invented oral history genre, where writers craft semi-fictional narratives in English based off of life history interviews conducted with older Iranians in Persian. The genre deliberately blurs the line between fiction and non-fiction in order to capture the aspects of a story that apply across individual experiences. The resulting pieces, which Mani will discuss in more detail and read an example of, bear the accuracy of a poem or an impressionistic painting as opposed to that of a journalistic investigation. In fact, just as we've translated across historical experience various aspects of our poetry series, which involve original poems by writers in English as well as translations from Persian to English, deliberately focus on translation as a craft, as a way of thinking. The theme of the second issue, oh, Sorry, um, here's some pages or some spreads from that first issue. So what we've done is we've taken archival ads that were uh, published in Iranian publications um, from really any time in history, 1960s, 70s, uh, but also during the revolution, after the revolution, um, and we've placed those in the magazine. So we have no ads that are commercially relevant. Um, we have these ads instead. Um, and this is a spread of our first oral history published in the first issue. And this is some of the design work that's in the magazine. Um, so this is design work that accompanied one of the nonfiction articles, which was about Persian nursery rhymes um, and the history of Persian nursery rhymes. So um, the theme of the second issue of the magazine, published in June of 2013, was the body. From the embodied experience of the cultural histories referred to in our first issue to the definition of a broader body politic. In short, what exactly does it mean at the level of the body to be Iranian? Some of the most outstanding work in this collection was nonfiction. Um, this is the table of contents, so just to show you a bit more of the design work. Um, so some of the, the most outstanding work in this collection was nonfiction in nature. <laughs> this, slide, this slide right here shows part of a curated archive that we received anonymously from an underground organization that calls itself the Society for the Preservation of the Iranian Nose. Uh, 
it's really a very valuable intervention in cultural dialogue, and so <laughs> we decided to, to publish it. Um, generally, however, nonfiction selections include critical essays, interviews, and translations that pertain to an issue theme or the broader mission of the project. Dar Dr. Martin Luther King wants to talk right now. Um, these submissions identify and engage emerging academic research in the social sciences and humanities, but are written in a language that appeals to a broader audience. Or conversely, they include interviews with individuals producing alternative left field culture and art with a particular emphasis on the creative process, on how they came to do what they did. This issue, the second issue, for example, included an interview with history professor Firuz Akashani Sabet on the management of the body and the related formation of the body politic in Iran at the turn of the century, alongside interviews with Lloyd Miller and Dariush Dolat Shahi, each of whom have experimented with Iranian classical music, only to be shunned in many ways from the canon of Iranian classical music, and alongside the translation of an interview with Ahmad Fadid, who, as you may know, had introduced Martin Heidegger into Iranian philosophical discourse and influenced much of the political thought behind the 79 revolution, but who wrote, rarely wrote his ideas down and is yet to be translated into English. So we're looking to find these kinds of materials, these kinds of conversations, and to present them for the first time, if possible. The topic of our third and most recently released issue is street culture. The issue is unique for us in that uh, at least half, if not more, of the contributors are based in or had been up until recently based in Iran. The question then becomes for us, how do we as editors framing content in the so-called diaspora present this material? What, what are we drawn to when we look at it? Uh, this is an interview uh, of a, this is a spread of an interview with Salman Aga, a professional skateboarder of Iranian descent based in Los Angeles, who talks in the interview about traveling to Iran from the States during the revolution, skating from a place of anger uh, tied to the racism he faced during the hostage crisis, and how he ended up creating a new skating style in response. Uh, in addition to this, the kinds of content that you'll see in the third issue is a, uh, is is something like this. The second spread is of Ardashir Mohassas' sketches, which were done in New York. Um, they're held by the Mohassas Trust. They haven't been shown before. Um, they only recently were publicly displayed in Art Dubai. So the piece is accompanied by an interview with the curators who exhibited his work there um, and the decisions they made in presenting the work as they did. The issue also features uh, work like this. This is a photograph by Arash Sardinia um, for a series called Chetori Motori. Generally speaking, our visual arts section uh, features never before seen engagements with established figures in the visual arts community who either work on topics pertaining to Iran and or are of Iranian descent. We are particularly keen on presenting the artistic process of these ind individuals in an interview format or better yet through drafts of works in progress. These appear alongside the work of artists who possess talent but, but who are yet to attain widespread recognition, be it in Iran or in the diaspora at large. These artists are generally asked to produce original pieces in response to the issue theme. Ideally, their work is crafted and developed in conversation with our editorial board who provide the artist with feedback over the course of the production process. Finally, the last part of our project is a record label, an initiative that emerged out of our podcast series where rare musical recordings were made available. The second of these podga podcasts was released on vinyl, uh, Omid Walizadeh's Modern Persian Speech Sounds, which involves original compositions of electronic music that draw all of their source material and sounds from recordings produced in the 1960s and 70s, primarily for children, primarily by the Kanun of Parvarish Effect Yekudakan Bano Jawanan in Iran. This latest branch of the project highlights our shared archival sensibility. There's an emphasis here on digging through the archives and finding materials produced by generations past. This is, however, an admittedly fraught endeavor. To what extent is it possible to maintain our excitement for studying the past without a romantic nostalgia for it? At what point can that uh, kind of an investigation be tempered with a more tragic disposition, one that accounts for the past that lives with us, even when we don't want it to, when we aren't excited about it being there? I think these are questions that we can all talk about in further uh, depth during the roundtable and the Q&A. For now, I think it's safe to say that Be Taught Off as a project is united by a desire to not only take from the archive, but to also give back to it in a tangible fashion. To this end, we've insisted on producing material objects that you can hold in your hands, um, and that by consequence can last for generations to come in their own right. 
So I'll leave it at that and allow others to carry on the conversation. Okay. Uh, sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Solmaz Sharif. Um, thank you for coming. I want to add my my voice to the chorus thanking Persis, who has changed my life personally. When I was 13, I wrote a, a poem, a little poem, that she then found and published in A World Between. And um, one kind of skewed the way I saw the publishing world, because then I thought, oh, it's kind of easy. Um, when it, it's not. Uh, and, um, you know, m made me officially a poet, you know. And she continues to support and encourage me, so I thank her for that. Um, and to that end, I wanted to just read a poem of mine as a way to introduce myself. Um, this poem is not necessarily one that deals with um, Iran in any kind of uh, rigid sense, but speaks to how I see these identity-based prisms and understandings um, as ways to actually build connections and collaborations between all kinds of identities. And when I was uh, 16, I heard um, Angela Davis speak at the Iranian Women's Studies um, Conference in Berkeley. Um, this year, actually, it's happening in, in Los Angeles this summer. And she used the word, uh, or she used the words women of color to describe Iranian women. And it was the first time I'd heard it, you know, and I, and I could, and it immediately resonated with me. And it was the first time that I felt comfortable using an identity term. Um, and, and because that is an identity that's based on, you know, building collaborations between different people. Um, so based on my own awareness of, you know, redacted documents and, and prison and, and all that stuff, uh, I'm just going to read a short poem. It's called Reaching Guantanamo. Um, when letters are sent to inmates in Guantanamo, they are often redacted by the Joint Task Force. Um, so they're heavily censored. Reaching Guantanamo. Dear Salim, love, are you well? Do they you? I worry so much. Lately, my hair, even my skin, the doctors tell me it's, I believe them, it shouldn't. Please don't worry. And moths have gotten to your mother's. Remember, I've enclosed some, made this batch just for you. Please eat well. Why did you, me to remarry? I told, and he couldn't, it. I would never, love, I'm singing that, you loved. Remember the line that went, I'm holding the, just for you, yours. So I want to talk a little bit about the form of a magazine and what it means actually for us to choose this form when, when we could have chosen, you know, a variety of forms. Um, and I recently heard a Palestinian poet by the name of Ghassan Zaktan read. And he was asked about the role of the Palestinian poet. And when, when tracing the, the shifts that have happened after the Nakba, um, he talked about this move away from the poet um, being the collective into the more personal. And the way he described it was that the poet, uh, the Palestinian poet, had stepped off of the frame on the wall where he had been hung and now was sitting on the couch in the living room among the people. And um, I think of magazines as the language of that living room, you know, and I like that idea of the personal still including a collective. There is a we there. Um, the language of various we's decided by architecture, so the language of the living room, the coffee shop, the salon. Um, we, are, we are all up here as writers and poets, scholars, translators, and various combinations therein involved in a number of knowledge-making endeavors. We are fluent in the languages of, of the peer-reviewed paper, the letter to the editor, the semi-yearly literary journal, the blog, and so forth. Any number of the articles we publish in Bitarov could be published in these other arenas, but the magazine form, print, and online allows us to place all of these in conversation. 
The magazine is not like the ephemeral newspaper interested in disseminating immediate bits of information, though a magazine may have such information. It is not like the more enduring bound book, though some of its essays and stories and poems may later be republished as such. A magazine is more conversational, vernacular, than these kin mediums. I don't even mean to say that the language inside the magazine is necessarily conversational, but the fact of a magazine is. It is brief, but impactful, subjective, but knowledgeable, polyvocal, varied in approach and tactic. Even the quality of the magazine paper speaks to this relationship with time and consequence. It's not the quickly yellowing and disintegrating newsprint, not the austere and purposeful paper of books, but instead often glossy, sexier, a paper that respects visual information and, and experience as much as text, that prioritizes design, admits it's not made to last, but doesn't want to be chucked out tomorrow. It lives, even weekly magazines, in a bit of a lag, though of its time. And because of this lag, it is in deeper, more long-form relationship to its material. Still, it does not claim the expertise of a scholarly book or novel. The magazine is willing, in other words, to take the temperature of culture, to begin to name it, to place these cultural realities next to each other without claiming authoritativeness. It is reflection of and creation of taste and aesthetic experience. I've been responsible for the translation poetry section that we are developing online. Uh, we find this important because we want to be in conversation with Iran and with poets writing in Persian. An online platform affords us the opportunity to potentially keep pace with what is happening in Iran, a pace faster than anthologies or print journals, while reaching a broad audience. This is us saying we want this conversation to be immediate, to be current. And we want these translations speaking to and resonating with the pages that Mani will discuss um, in more detail. Right now we have a translator, translation by a young translator named Samad Alavi up of Shamlu's um, Sheri Kizendigist, or a poetry that is life. And despite Shamlu's obvious status as free verse dawn in 20th century Iranian poetry, this poem, an earlier kind of uh, friskier, rougher poem, does not appear in translation in any anthology or publication I could find. This is, of course, one problem of displacement, that our experience and knowledge of our home cultures become narrowed and distilled by tastemakers, by scholars, by scarcity beyond our control. We are most sensitive to gatekeeping. To understand a poet, we must know the range of the poet's work, including her or his lesser or early work. To understand a language is to understand I mean, to understand a poet is to understand a language. To understand a language is to understand if such a thing exists, a people. It's important for us as a magazine, again, to broaden the conversation around this poetry, both in what we publish and in the fact that it finds itself juxtaposed against stories of diaspora. Um, this is not just a transference of data. In other words, this is a we, an intimate and shifting one. Um, I want to read a little bit of Samad's uh, translation, A Poetry That Is Life. Today, poetry is the weapon of the masses because poets themselves are one branch from the forest of the masses, not jasmines and hyacinths in the hot house of so-and-so. The poet of today is no stranger to the collective toils of the masses. He smiles with the people's lips. He grafts the people's hopes and pains upon his bones. Today, the poet must wear nice clothes, lace up his clean and well-waxed shoes. Then, from the busiest points in the city, with a precision particular to him, he must extract his subject, meter, and rhyme, one by one from the passerby. Come with me, dear fellow citizen. For three whole days, I've looked for you and knocked on every door. Inside the latest print magazine, I include a little, there's a little translation by myself, or an attempted one of Ahmad Shamlu's Kitab e Kuche, or the Book of the Street. Um, perhaps the most ineffable in translation, more so than diction or music or syntax, is the cultural and social energy of the word. 
It's the sayings, the quips, the slang, the deliciousness in the mouth, the absolute felicity and democratic undertaking behind the creation of language that is impossible to translate. And it's perhaps most central to language. It's a writer's and a society's bread and butter, so it's no wonder that Ahmad Shamlu, a poet, turns lexicographer for Kitab Kuche to gather the lexicon of the street from esoteric to commonplace in a multi-volume sprawling encyclopedia slash dictionary. The writing of such a project is a doomed project. Language is so alive and in flux, especially on the level of the street, by the, that by the time one gathers and pins down the pieces, it has already slipped away. Akin here, then, to the lifespan of a magazine, this book moves from reference and guidance tool to culturally complete historical artifact within one's lifetime. I see this translation as translation as eavesdropping because the point is not necessarily to translate it into a dictionary that would then be useful in English, so it becomes you know, a Persian to English dictionary, but to try and eavesdrop on what it would mean to have this book in Persian before you. And I'm interested in this dictionary and in this magazine because I'm interested in what we lost culturally, socially, aesthetically, and displacement. This translation, of Kitab e Kuche was just an attempt to hear, however dimly, the din of the streets I would have otherwise walked. The magazine is an attempt to relay the cadence, the choreography of the motley ones we do. And uh, with that, I'd like to pass it on to Mani. Thank you so much for being a tough act to follow. Um, my name is Monty Patcham, and uh, like the others, I'd like to echo my thank yous to Perseus for. Stop. <laughs> okay, I take it back. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay, be tough. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a brief rundown of uh, what we do with the oral history component. Um, the idea is that we just. We ask writers to do this, but it, it's it, just logistically it's a difficult um, thing to ask of. You know, writing is difficult enough as it is. And so we ask writers to gather interviews to find people that they find particularly interesting or who have a particular story. And we ask them to kind of interview them to to feel out a story, to suss out the um, the peculiarities, the, the nuances that may be commonplace or may be boring uh, for the interviewee. Um, and then to kind of get a feel for a time and place, uh, a moment where um, others may not have had that kind of uh, ability to access for whatever various reasons. Um, and so, ap so then they listen to it, and then they transcribe the bits that they like, and then uh, they they find a kernel of interest. It could be. It could be something small, it could, but it's enough to find an idea to, to write a story, to fill in the narrative gaps. Um, and then you can work within the imaginative peripheries of the idea. Um, now, I, I confess there's a bit of arrogance with trying to create this new um, uh, blending of oral history and nonfiction and fiction. And, um, and to be quite honest, I, I I'm as much experience as, as I've had with through Bitaraf. I still don't know what the hell I'm doing, and and it's primarily because each story has its own essence. Each story has its own um, uh, flavor and and the approach to how it was delivered, the approach to how it came about. Uh, it varies story to story, and so um, we we try to have conversations about how it turns out now. This was all off the cuff, and so a bit of navel gazing just for a paragraph. Um, and, and then I'm just going to read from this. Uh, so, the oral history section of Bitarov is an idea that stemmed from the desire to tell the stories we heard at Mehmuni's growing up, stories that we heard as children, stories that, particularly for myself, uh, seemed at once foreign and familiar. I confess I still harbor some of that childish, mystical romanticism of Iran, and the only time I visited Iran was in 2004. 
And uh, while much of that romanticism was, uh, for better or for worse, quickly put to bed, it's hard to shed the imaginings of your childhood. Um, so I wanted to reside in that literary space uh, that accommodated these imaginings without the saccharine nostalgia, without the tried and true refrain, things were different before the revolution. Um, Oral histories seem to provide such a space. I was first exposed to oral histories when I read a piece in Granta by uh, Russian journalist Svetlana Alexievich called Boys in Sync. Boys in Sync is a series of snapshots of the people directly and indirectly affected by the Soviet assault on Afghanistan during the 1980s. The domestic propaganda the Soviet government fed its citizens was one of duty, of a definite and pending victory. In reality, Afghan resistance proved uncooperative. Thousands of Soviet soldiers were returned and buried in zinc coffins. Uh, government officials disrupted funerals and large gatherings of mourners. Any public dissatisfaction with the war hurt the Servi Soviet cause. Alexievich delivered a dose of reality to the war-weary public. But there was something more to boys and sing. There was nuance and a hunting, haunting touch uh, to the language of the piece's subjects which I attribute to Alexievich's interference. And while I recognize that interpreters could potentially have had a hand in the language, uh, I'm much more in the camp that Alexievich had manipulated the words to double down on the impact of the stories. She seems to kind of work in the same journalistic haze as uh, Richard Kapuczynski, who some of you may know from Shaw of Shaw's, um, though with greater fidelity to content. Um, I'd suddenly seen a new vision for how a story could be presented. The style could be utilized as a cross-cultural and cross-generational outlet, presenting stories where the focus is the story, the experience. It could deliver a non-fiction first-person account, but in whatever sequence and style the author chose to deliver it. Uh, another person who kind of influenced... All right. Uh, okay. So while not an... Uh, another... Well, sorry. Another person who influenced um, uh, my... Uh, uh, kind of delivery on this was uh, Dave Edgars and and while he's not an oral historian per se he is a popular writer who sets up camp in this gray area of true not true he does his due diligence with information he collects it with journalistic gusto but then he sculpts it and fills in the gaps with what is his best guess and an ear for narrative tone um, in what is the what Eggers takes on the point of view of a Sudanese refugee escaping the Janjaweed militia and eventually seeking asylum in America the facts are as the main character has told them to Eggers. They work in harmony to deliver a story that needs telling. Similarly, BT, uh, we're all close, we can call it BT now. Um, uh, BT uh, is, in, encourages people to write from other people's stories, to delve into the contours of what we hear in the voices of their telling, of the facts they remember, of the way their lives and experiences since then could have shaped that memory. And part of the um, thinking behind that is that uh, no memory is ever accurate. Um, any thousands of uh, things you may want to forget or uh, add to a memory, um, with each recall of something, the, uh, the, the memory changes shape just a, a hair. And so that can affect, so nonfiction and fiction kind of on its own, if you want to be strict, uh, strictly def definitive, um, the more I, I work with Bitorov, there are no strict definitions between fiction and nonfiction. Um, so, more often than not, what you read in Bitorov are stories c uh, delivered in the Dave Eggers style, a direct narrative, and not one in the style of your typical Svetlana Alexievich or Studs Turkalesque oral history. But, what, but we encourage writers to sit down with a person and interview them because it adds a dimension to the story that otherwise would not materialize just by listening to the recording of an interview. A person's affect, arms crossed, a sense of indifference, a bitter laugh. These are all pieces of the puzzle. A puzzle. It can be a laborious practice, interviewing people, then transcribing the parts that you enjoyed or found intriguing, then creating a story to round out the narrative. But it's also a rewarding process, trying to recreate a scene with the facts as you know them, and then filling in the gaps as best and as creatively as you can. So this was more or less a, a macro scale of, uh, of the oral history section. Uh, now I'd like to focus on some of the conversations we've had on the micro level. Most pieces involve a conversation among the editorial board, um, ranging from aesthetics to certain detail to practices we should consider. Uh, one such uh, conversation I've had with the others is the accepted practice of italicizing non-English words. 
This initially sprung from an email exchange with our esteemed facilitator, Arash Saidinia. Hey, how's it going, buddy? Uh, regarding his fine essay on Tarof in our first issue. If you know Arash, and I recommend that you do, um, uh, what you know is that he is incredibly intense as, as he is affable. But um, he had taken issue. He's very precise with language and, um, and, uh, and, and terse, but not, not in, in, a, in a brevity is his key. And so, like, he, he chooses his words perfectly. Um, but so he had taken issue with some of my initial edits, but the one that stood out to me the most and still does was his opposition to my italicizing those words that were not in English. To be specific, he had called this established practice a convention, which in those early days of BT, I had taken some offense. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know what I said at the times, so I, I, I got a little red in the face, you know, Galat <laughs> Kar! And then, um, and then I confess that in many ways I'm a fuddy-duddy, but this was a standard that I never imagined finding opposition. Um, but it stuck with me, and I realized that perhaps there was something to it. The core of BT's principles was to advance the conversation, to bypass the oversaturation of Iran-centric exoticism that the American media provided. And I should also know that this is not without the complicity of many Iranian Americans. Uh, does italicizing non-English language further distance Iranian culture from our non-Iranian readers? It's a subtle thing, but the convention, um, but the convention of italicization has been ingrained in readers. The expectation of not knowing, and with not knowing, begins the tentacles of otherizing, particularly when cultures cultures are involved. <laughs> now that I've dedicated so much time to the cancellation of italicization in this context, uh, we went ahead and continued its practice. Um, we decided that to suddenly change the approach would have had people scrambling for their dictionaries and would have proved too much of a distraction for the reader. Even in the copy editing phase, it quickly tripped us up and we agreed to scrap the idea. But it was the conversation that I wanted to highlight. I think what sets us apart is that we pay attention to the minutiae, and I confess to sometimes rather exhausting levels. We hope, however, that our sense of detail and consideration transfers to the reader. Uh, so the editorial board also takes up conversations about representation within a piece. In our second issue, we had an excellent or oral history, uh, The Message by Paddy Shafafi. Um, uh, that in its initial draft had multiple and continuous references to beards and um, hijabs and assigned them to unsympathetic or stock characters. These were seen by some of the editors as common and belabored tropes on scary fundamentalists. In the, and in the initial conversation, I was uncomfortable asking the writer, an academic by training, to take out what was seen by some to be coded language for bad Muslims. I also had trouble justifying the removal of what seemed to be basic facts. The antagonist had a beard and another wore a hijab. These were truths as the story delivered them. And while we were on the topic of truths, the beard and hijab had all the markings of an interview detail, facts that an interview subject told the writer. To my logic, removing such details felt a bit like censorship. In the context of Iranian and by extension Middle Eastern politics, the beard and full hijab is a signifier to both sympathetic and non-sympathetic observers alike. To do away with these allusions felt like an artificial solution to a problematic hurdle. My suggestion was not to do away with the, uh, com not to completely do away with the allusions to beards and the hijab, though I did pare down the references. I mean, after a certain point, we get it. Um, instead, I suggested that the writer humanize the antagonists. Simply put, they don't operate in a vacuum of malevolence. Furthermore, speaking as a writer and editor, creating such one-dimensional characters indicates an, an agenda at worst and an incomplete consideration of the scope of the story at best. This is not to say that I suspect that the contributor had any agendas. She simply may have been caught up in telling a story from the viewpoint of the person who experienced it. And this is another one of those things where I don't know what the hell I'm talking about because this is exactly what we want them to do. We want them to get into the heads of these right of of their subjects. And um, and I went ahead and said, well, that was nice. Please change it just a little bit. And and so that's and and so there's some discomfort and uh, a lot of disharmony in how and how we approach it. And I think. And I, I appreciate that we have these conversations because it, um, it makes me a better writer. I think it makes the piece in the, in the magazine a lot better. And, um, and it, it opens you up to new angles of how to approach a story. Um, so 
I'm just going to wrap up a little bit. Uh, BTARF is a space where conventional oral histories and fiction merge. There's an inherent tension in that combination of true and not true, and each story submitted brings up issues that we cannot anticipate. Is this a control piece? Does it seem to have an agenda outside of solid storytelling? Is it even a good story? Did I enjoy reading this? Since it's each piece has its own set of pecul peculi peculiarities, uh, as does each BT editor, I must add, each piece <laughs> is delivered with care and consideration with a premium being placed on how it serves the reader, the community, and ultimately the dialogue. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and, how long have I been talking for? 10 minutes? Another half hour? Another half hour? Oh, total. Uh, okay, now I'll read the shorter piece. So, I'm going to read Yeki Bud Yeki now, but this is my first piece for Be Taught Of. Um, it's kind of brief. Um, I've lived two lives, my brother's and my own, made easier simply because I don't remember him. 63 years ago, he was born Abdul Namir. Then two years later, I, Sina, was born. Abdul died of typhoid not three years after that. My parents had kept his pictures on the walls, images of him playing with the same toys I eventually adopted. After some time, the only thing of his that remained was his name. My parents had wanted me in school as soon as possible, both for the education and to lighten my mother's workload at home. When I was four, my father took me to the primary school, bent down and said, when the teacher calls for Abdul Amir, you say here, Amidi. I nodded. From then I answered to my brother's name and celebrated his birthdays. I earned his certificates and his degrees and carried his name with me everywhere I went. Unless he went to college, serving for two years in the army was compulsory. I was not yet 17 when I joined and found myself stationed in Ghazvin, where everybody knew me as Abdul. Three days after I completed my service, a uniformed officer arrived at the door to my parents' home. The officer introduced himself and said that he'd been trying to locate Sina Amir for him to arrive for duty. I accepted his letter and told him I would pass it along when my brother returned. I closed the door when the officer left. It hasn't been a week since I returned and now I have to serve again. But I didn't worry long. By then all of Sina's identification papers had my picture and I realized I had little to worry about. My mother came in from the garden. Kibud, she asked. I told her the Iranian government was calling on Sina Amir to serve his country. Who do they think you are? You're but one man, she said. The three of us stood there laughing. Thank you very much. So I'll begin by making a very obvious observation, which is that this conversation happens as a result of the magazine. We would not be here if not for the opening up of this physical space that is the, the magazine. And we can think of making be it a magazine or a painting as a kind of intervention. Many nouns and verbs attend. A magazine is fixed. And as Solmaz points out, it's of its time. It creates a space. And so I'd like to begin, and we'll open up the questions from the floor, by asking about this space that's opened up. Uh, I begin with Arash. I think it'd be useful for all of us to, to hear more about because you're, in a sense, the initial instigator of this intervention, this, this project, which is tentative, which is um, a process. What kind of space did you envision? What kind of space is emerging from not just the, the physical space of the magazine itself, but this imagined space? What, what's emerging out of um, the publication of these issues and, for that matter, the web presence and the records themselves? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, I think that when we initially conceptualized this, and this might be a controversial thing to say or not, um, I think there wa we, we felt like there wasn't a space for this kind of a conversation. Um, and the thing that, in terms of the content of the space, the thing we had in mind was to do something for left field, alternative, like, if, if we think of being Iranian-American as such, as marginalized, we're like, well, what about the people that are at the margins of that margin? Because um, at least for myself or some of the people that I was in conversation with, I think that's um, where we were coming from and what we wanted to somehow capture. 
Uh, and so the sense that we had about ourselves was that there was people doing great work individually, but there wasn't necessarily one single space for all of those folks or those people to come together. Um, and so we were curious about what would happen if we brought those people together, what would be produced. Um, and so the magazine, to me, is a result of that. Do either of you want to speak to this idea of space? I think Arash pretty much nailed it on the head. We just wanted to kind of create this I, uh, I Before Be Taught Of, I'd read a lot of, uh, I guess memoirs were, were pretty big, and, um, and a lot of it was centered, uh, centered around Iran, centered around the revolution, Iran pre-revolution, Iran post-revolution, and, and a lot of like kind of the... Um, the, the 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 dissonance between being an Iranian in America, particularly in the aftermath of the hostage crisis, and to me that at first it was interesting, and then after a while it became labored a little bit. It, the point became belabored, and, and we evolve. Um, you know, the older we get, we evolve, and and we find our niches, and we're no longer exposed to such. Um, uh, Iran may be exposed to such uh, hostilities uh, from an American public, but we, I think we've, we've found some level of assimilation, and, and I think we've, um, it, it was time to uh, turn the page a little bit. Can, can I add something? Um, I think one interesting facet in terms of the response that we've gotten with regards to the space, um, the, the further we go along and the further, the more people find out about the magazine and the more positive feedback we get, to a certain extent there's these opportunities for the magazine itself to start to kind of become institutionalized, to come out from the margins. And, and the question, at least for myself, is at what point do we start becoming corny? At what point is there a margin to what we're producing that we're not even anticipating? And how do you, how do you keep up on, on producing that kind of content or that kind of material? I don't know. That's an open-ended question. Wouldn't be bad, though, if a group of kids got together and parodied Bitaro. <laughs> yes. The Society for the Destruction of Bitaro Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> or Bitaro. <laughs> Bitaro, yeah. I mean, a, r a related question is, you know, because this is opening up space, what are the stories that need to be told? And when I say stories, uh, not just narratives, but where is the, where is the need? You know, where is the need? So, uh, you know, so much for example, I think can speak very articulately to this incredible need for poetry and translation for an exposure to Iranian poets, contemporary Iranian poets in Iran, and to the entire, if we call it a canon or not, receiving some kind of audience outside of Iran. No, absolutely. I, and I, I think that, um, as I kind of said in the, in the talk, that um, there, there are a number of issues with translation. One being that so few books are published, period, in translation. And then of that, which ones are actually Persian language? And then how do you decide which poets writing in Persian you translate? You know, And that participates in this canonicization of what this poetry means. So Iranian poetry becomes more and more um, distilled as it reaches us in the states. Um, whereas it is obviously varied and it's alive now and we are in a very lucky moment that we have technology to communicate and to get that out faster um, and to respond to it in time and to have artistic conversations across those borders in real time as opposed to the kind of usual lag of, of um, cultural exchange, you know, where something will like reach a decade later or so and then start taking off. Um, and that's always been important for me. I've always wanted to, to read these people, to find them. Nobody was doing it and, you know, I think very much in the spirit of Bitarov, it's like you don't see it being done so you, you step up and, and do it yourself. Um, but the other, the other language or the other thing that was missing was that in the original conversations that Davidi and I had was that I was very interested in collecting uh, oral history specifically of um, leftists that were involved and have been displaced um, in the Iranian revolution and not the, not the, the leaders or the, you know, the people up top that everyone can kind of name, um, but 
but everybody, you know, the people I kind of, I grew up around and who had all these incredible stories. Um, and to try and find a way to just archive those stories. And, and there are a lot of people, I know like Manija and, and you know, are, is doing fantastic work around this, so I'm, I'm happy to see that happen. Um, but I knew that I wanted to kind of also disrupt that, that uh, vision of especially like Los Angeles Iranians. Um, the, the gala attending crowd is not necessarily, you know, the only crowd. Money, what's the feedback been like on some of these oral histories? Um, not only from the subjects, but from people reading it. Do they say, oh, I see myself there? Or is there a laughter of recognition that echoes and resonates in a way that you find gratifying? You know, uh, I confess I don't get a lot of feedback, only, mainly from the people that, you know, and, and, and I, part of that is because of my location. I live in D.C. There's a lot of Iranians there, but it, it's just not as... Um, uh, it's, it, there's not as much, I guess, gathering. There's not as much um, uh, kind of outlets to present stuff like this. And so um, usually people who buy it are people who, who know me and are like, ah, we'll do this, we'll throw this guy a bone. <laughs> but then, um, but I have had a couple of people, like, you know, I really enjoyed this story. I thought that story was funny. Um, that one story with uh, the one that I was speaking about, how these chef office was very... Um, uh, that got a lot of, uh, I think, that brought back a lot of memories, particularly, and I confess that my family is um, a, a pair of leftists, uh, and they, um, the, their, their friends and family, I think, saw a lot of resonance with that story. So, um, th there is some, there is recognition, but the, but it's been muted, kind of. Hmm. I know we're all fans of, for example, he has a, he did a piece called What About Khosrow? Can you talk about that a piece? Because, I mean, I, first of all, I see Khosrow on the page. That's already something that's relatively new for us. And then, you know, you consider in the context where we have a lot of memoirs, you know, but I like to say, you know, if you wanted to compile them all into one grand title, it would be The Veil in the Secret Garden of Jasmine and the, you know, and it's very, these very, very tired tropes. Um, uh, but 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 this is what take what about Khosrow for example? It's a story you don't commonly right. see, and you're doing something that's very funny, and yet means a lot. I mean, to say okay, the student experience of coming over here right. and the interactions between these people who maybe they came voluntarily, maybe they didn't, but they're trying to make a life for themselves. These right. are really important stories. So that's actually probably the most. Uh, uh, in, in the oral history context, that's the one that kind of has the same framework as somebody like Stud Circle or uh, Alexei um, Svetlanovich, or Svetlana Alexievich, excuse me, Russian names. Um, and so it was, it's the story about uh, these two uh, roommates in, in the United States. They're trying to, just like you said, they're trying to go to university, but they're also supremely involved with the uh, anti-shell movement and then this guy who happens to know through somebody through somebody through somebody one of the roommates and it better than I can yeah but the story yeah the the, st the idea of uh, the guest that won't leave is probably something that um, that is pretty universal and actually I'll be in town for the rest of the week <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wants to open up any space. There's, a, there's an interesting story about that story as well. Um, to my knowledge, that story was based off of an actual conversation with three people. And then at some point, maybe um, when the second issue was being published, Monty told me that it was 95% fabrication. Um, <laughs> so everybody believed it, and everybody thought it was completely accurate. Um, and, and so this, this to me was like really a representative of this blurring of the lines between fiction and nonfiction. 90% of the editorial staff was fooled on this one. Um, but it still rang true on some of them. Yeah. Fact and truth are not necessarily commensurate. Can you, can you speak to, I think one of, the, one of the great challenges that we face now is because is that we're seeing a lot of really wonderful stories and possibilities for doing things, some things that we can't even talk about. So, but what we can talk about are the politics of editorial politics. I mean, a, a side question and another question would be to talk about the editorial process, which is intensely democratic and carries its own challenges. But what about the stories that can't necessarily be told because Bitarov has to occupy a space that won't 
literally alienate people and cause them harm, but also allows the magazine to circulate without being pigeonholed. Can you, can you speak to that? Sure. I mean, I think this is most um, relevant to the production of the third issue where we have, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, half of the contributors are based in Iran. So the question for us is, um, how can we produce content that will allow the conversation to keep going? Right? And I think that um, we, we've had a number of moments where, um, for example, there was an article that could have been published about covers of punk records that were produced between 1977 and 1982 where punk culture in the United States was all about being as defiant as you possibly can. So the image of Khomeini was on a bunch of punk records made by these American kids. So what is that all about, right? Like, what do those images look like? What's the story behind that? But if we publish that piece, the kinds of images of Khomeini that we'd have to publish in the magazine, the stakes of then trying to take that magazine to Iran to give it to the contributors or the contributors who've already contributed to this magazine and have their name associated with it, what does that mean for them? Um, so we've had to make those kinds of decisions to not publish that piece. We didn't publish that piece. Um, so I think uh, there's, there's those kinds of decisions and, and we're, we're effectively engaging in a kind of self-censorship, but the, I think it, the, it's been worth it because of the conversations that it's allowed and made possible. There's plenty to talk about without, without us having to publish that particular piece or those kinds of pieces. And so that's been the challenge for us. Let's find those things that we can talk about and how is that productive and generative? How is it a challenge that actually inc incites or inspires conversation? Do we have questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, that sounds great. I I could come to your editorial and just be talking <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just so impressed. Um, I don't know if you guys know about Dialogue, which was Dialogue, which was published in Iran, and, for, and I was lucky enough to sit in one of their editorial meetings, and it was like you, and, and it was just fascinating. So it, it just reminds me of those glorious moments in Iran. This is after the revolution. How do you, how do you deal with um, the language of Iranian your generation? I mean, I, I don't want to speak for everybody else, but from my conception of it, we're the old-fashioned faction of the young generation. Yeah. <laughs> so we are, yeah, so we, uh, we insist upon print publications, we insist upon vinyl records, we put out a vinyl record, I mean that's how old fashioned. Drama phone. Yeah. <laughs> so um, where our Twitter account is okay, we tweet sometimes. We don't, no. we don't accept it. Yeah, we push people, yeah. Other questions? questions. It's a hustle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, we a lot of it is donation based. A lot of it is um, uh, pounding the pavement, finding places to sell the magazine. I know in California, they, we do have a few subscribers as well. I know in in LA, Audash and Audash have done uh, immeasurable help getting the name out there with um, events and, uh, and 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 like going to check out the Kitab and and. Uh, trying to get some kind of uh, just get get uh, creating exposure so and and just reaching out to friends and family and and but donations is pretty much what it comes down to I just also want to say thank you because it's really a, a endeavor of love and passion and and I'm so impressed mm -hmm. thank you all. thank you there is precedent there was a really one I mean you think about 
maybe I'll talk about it on a, on, a, on, a, on a later panel, but, you know, I was someone that from a very early age was looking around trying to see myself in books and, you know, in films. And um, Saida Pokravan's journal, Chante, which some people in this room may remember, was a very important thing. I mean, now if you see, I look now, you know, I see some of the people involved in it, you know, the people that are doing the necessary work. You look at Nafisi's history of Iranian cinema. I mean, without it, who? There's a friend of mine, uh, Ali Bakhtiari, who's one of our contributing editors. The work that he's doing on Persian pop music, um, he just published a book on the Kanun and all the Kanun records. This is, this is you, know, I, you know, I'm not religious, but you know, the kind of work that he's doing is kind of, <laughs> uh, it's special work. Yeah, it's, it's uh, if, if not Bakhtiari, who's going to do it? You know, and I think that what the editors are doing here is is just that that it opens up a space. Um, and you know, those chantes which were published in print, they still exist in university libraries. And maybe Arash can speak to this. You know that there may only be 500 copies of each of these issues thus far, but they will be in libraries. And an enterprising, inquisitive kid who might not see it in Sherkati Ketab or at one of our openings or events may eventually dig it up and it will speak to 2014, 2012, 2013, but beyond those dates. Maybe we should open it up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, I had a glance at your magazine. It's really beautiful uh, product. It's Thanks. really nice to look And uh, concerning your audience, uh, your magazine intend to connect the American, uh, Iranian Americans to Iran, or in Iranian Americans also to the rest of the American citizens and groups and communities. When I looked at it, I had the feeling that it's most, uh, mostly to connect you to what's happening in Iran, and we all know that it's very dynamic in terms of cultural production now. Um, can I add a third option? How about connecting Iranians across the globe who are not, who are somehow left field alternative to one another? I think that's the audience really, to, to kind of speak amongst ourselves. So if anybody wants to listen in on that conversation, the fine way, come on in. But you know, um, I think that's what our objective is. But you know, you can't um, so have a system. the Iranian diaspora worldwide? Yeah, but that includes people in Iran. Because I think there's plenty of people in Iran that are producing material that aren't necessarily within the mainstream of artist, the artistic scene there either, right? Um, and then there's people in Europe, then there's people in Canada, there's people in the US. So I think it's about having that conversation globally amongst ourselves. I, I would liken it to like, uh, think of a band that you respect and artistic merit. They create the music that they enjoy. And if anybody else wants to come to their concerts, then so be it. If they want to sit in on this moment, then so be it. It's a special moment. So that's, we're creating what we enjoy. And, and if anybody, simply because it's written in English, I, I, it, it is a shame that it kind of limits those to English uh, readers. But, um, but we're doing what we want to do artistically as far as, 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 as wonderfully as, as, as we feel like we can do it. And if anybody else wants to come in and take part, then that's, yeah, Beth Anma, it is what I should say. When I look at your name tag, uh, clearly there's, you know, kind of, there's a mix going on with your accent. I'm wondering, where are you from? From France. From France. But you have, uh, but you have Iranian background, your parents. Yeah, so I mean, we would say, what's going on in France? You know, what, what can you tell us about the community there? You know, and we're, we're constantly looking. So, you know, we may, I, one of the places I think is uh, really interesting to some of us is this uh, Chababi in, uh, in, in L.A. that uh, uh, Ar Mehdi, he's from Esfahan, so he serves Beryuni, uh, which is the only Beryuni in, in L.A. But also in this place he has all this ephemera, he has all these records hanging from the wall and old Iranian cigarette packs and all the rest of that. The person that wrote the piece is actually a doctoral candidate from, uh, who's Iranian but has lived in uh, Holland. You know, so there's a lot of sort of dots that you can connect here to talk about just one piece. And so we're really interested in, you know, what's going on in Vancouver? What's going on in Toronto? What's going on in Georgia? What's going on in France? What's going on in Moscow or, you know, Australia? You know, the Australian population is, say, Sydney. You know, who can we, who can we find there to, to talk to and to contribute? And we're seeing contributions, I think, from a lot of places. Other questions? Yeah.
So, how, how do you choose what yeah, so one thing we do, I mean, I, I probably could have done a better uh, job describing how the visual arts section works, but what, one thing we like to do is we like to find artists who don't have a platform, so Farhad Fuzuni certainly does have a platform, as does Arya Kasai, as, uh, as do most of the artists actually who are working in Iran that are in the third issue. Um, what, the other thing we do is we like to get established artists um, whose work is shown and put them in a position that's unfamiliar, right? So have them talk about their process, have their drafts of their work displayed, right? Um, have them potentially in conversation with somebody who they wouldn't normally be in conversation with. Um, so we've done that with academics in our first issue. We had Hamid Nafisi actually in conversation with, uh, with a scholar who works on African-American film and cinema. Um, and and there, there's this kind of like challenging of Hamid Nafisi. So as opposed to it being a celebration of Farhad Fuzuni, a celebration of Hamid Nafisi, it's let's see how we can put them in a position where they're still comfortable enough to participate, but where they're maybe being thing, asked things that they wouldn't expect to be asked. Um, so that's the way we try to find something archival or new, you know, that we've unearthed in relation to an established figure. Um, in terms of the Iran, Iran aspect, we were not really working with too many Iranian artists. We had one in the first issue and one in the second issue. Um, the third issue has a number of Iranian artists, so that's something that we're starting to do. Um, so I, I think part of that involves um, our discovery of this art scene that potentially isn't as interesting to somebody who's based in Tehran and then the question becomes okay well what what are we doing what's interesting to us and why is it interesting to us and what can we offer new in terms of the framing of that material right? what does it mean to look at that material from our eyes having grown up in Los Angeles so I think that's what would be different or interesting about those pieces what's interesting something interesting happens is we show the stuff we show the magazine in Iran and it becomes a kind of entry point. You know, oh, you know. And then, you know, they get to see what people are doing. For example, what Kaveh Kashmir is doing. An Iranian artist, you know, I'm thinking about that lunch that we went to. Oh, so that's what that person is doing. But I think, you know, you look at Samir Yamin's work. You know, Iranian artists in Iran who don't know that work need to know that work because it's some of the best work that's being done in diaspora. So there's a really interesting cross-pollination or just put simply, maybe not pretentiously, awareness of what other people are doing, which I think is part of that opening up of, uh, of space, which I think is really exciting. And if I could add one other thing, Ali Akbar Sadari may be really well known, but this is a guy who's not getting, gotten enough attention for his animation, for his painting. So while may, many Iranians may know him, uh, this is someone who needs to be put on. You know, his, it becomes maybe, hopefully, in the future, you know, having an article about him spurs, you know, we show, hey, we're, we're serious in our interest. Can we show the films here? You know, it's because I think Bitarov is not just about print and then the records, but it's also about events, it's about community, it's about, you know, opening things up in terms of uh, a collective space, a collective physical space. Other questions? Yes. Um, in the way that you all presented your work, it, it, there's such a, a beautiful um, tension between process and product, and um, I was particularly struck by um, you, Mani, in, in the way that you're talking about uh, I mean, to, to be able to say that I don't know what I'm doing, I think is a thing to aspire to uh, and, and, and in terms of being uh, sort of the richness of, of inquiry that it allows. And I'm curious if, uh, in, in, in the, there's, a, if there's a space within uh, this magazine for uh, you to show the skeleton and the bones of what you're trying to produce. Because I, I don't think a space like this is uh, the only space where this conversation should be happening. I think it. I'm curious what, what it looks like in terms of making visible that process. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what, one thing that we're um, lagging on is an internet kind of presence, so that might be the kind of a space where something like that could be on display. Yes? Um, I think you mentioned that you know, you're
I mean, not every community faces serious contradictions that they struggle with. Politically, I mean, a variety of contradictions. We have our own, we have many that we are sitting in right now. It seems like, I'm wondering, can you, do you have a conscious process for dealing with the contradictions? It seems like you've kind of gotten, found a way to move beyond them while recognizing them, right? I, I, so I, I was wondering if that, if that's come up in your work, if you have a process for it, how you do it. The question of authenticity versus inauthentic, inauthenticity, who is Iranian, who is not Iranian, the generational question. How do you process that when you make decisions? I mean, I, I think it could be a model for all of us. Yeah, yeah. We kind of show it to you. I mean, if you've seen this, you're seeing it kind of happen right now. Here it is, us with all of our contradictions out. Um, but um, Speak I think for one yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Sorry. But I, I think um, one thing that maybe this gets to, to your question. One thing that we've done, which slows us down a lot, is we have these almost endless phone conversations <laughs> talking about you know what we're doing be communicating with one another I tend to be the go-between it stresses me out but you know you send e everything that happens you inform other people about it um, and that conversation it, 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 just keeping that conversation open allows us to work things out but it takes a lot of time and energy but uh, but I think it produces a, a better product at the end of the day and uh, I'm sorry I, and I would like that uh, with whatever we receive, it, it's like on, on a submission by submission basis. We don't just say, oh, this is an Iranian act, but that act. Right. Um, we, uh, so we just, we, 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 we have discussions on, on its individual merits and we talk about what we like and um, potentially could be worked upon on each. Um, but also, to further emphasize, those weekly conversations really kind of uh, coagulate into something um, pretty unique. It's, it, it's not, it's not, just the fact that we're four editors or however many editors on a magazine, it's, it's that um, it's, it's just the coming together, just that very simple act of it kind of uh, shapes and dictates the direction that each um, issue goes. So, I'm sorry, somebody had, somebody had their hand up. Yes? yes. Uh, I don't have a specific question, but I want to really thank you and congratulate you for whatever innovation not just for the magazine and the quality and the concept, the, the space that we are creating. And, and you heard your need. And because I'm from the left, from your parents' generation, <laughs> and I'm so glad that the new generation of leftists will produce such a beautiful new generation <laughs> that they are aware and mostly contrary to the left, they are so open to their uh, dark side and light side. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much for being you. It's very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Oh. Sure. Oh, um, could you, I mean, and maybe you said this and I missed it, but I mean, is there a political project to be total? And, you know, um, because everything's political, so, um, and if it is what it is, so if you marginalize, what do you marginalize from? What's the center? And 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 what are what are you? What is those margins being defined as? What's, you know, relative to what? More concrete, if there is a more concrete. Can I can I just jump in because I've got a I've got a thing that I Go can say it. here, <laughs> which is very simple. You, you we, several people sit before you who are very 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 political people very political people. I think that's fair and maybe a way of sort of just beginning to say something. No, that, so there's no, there's no, there's no sidestepping that. But I, ju I just want to say that for what it's worth because I think others can speak to this issue. No, my uh, sense is that it's it, quite clear that you yeah. are, but I can't quite name it. And, I, and, I, and, I, and my suspicion is that's also intentional, yeah. but you know. So it's a terrific I, question. So that's yeah, we're talking about yeah. it because it's, we're talking, I feel like we're talking like this and I'm just sort of curious. <laughs> but yeah. So. Some things are better not said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we could, we could, I could come out and I could try to put a stamp on it and I could put a label on it and say this is what its politics are. 
but then what if in so doing, you know, I put I close a door that, you know, Sonmas would want opened or I close a door that some future uh, contributor would want opened. So I, I think there I think we're more interested in having it be a question and having it be um, in something that's open and undefined and what that produces and what that generates. Because I think there's like an admitted element of us not knowing, right? And that's really what drives the, the, the conversation. That's what really drives the, the, the project, which is what about all the stuff we don't know, right? Because politics um, is necessary because it, it's there and it's disingenuous like most Iranian pol or any things that say we are not political, we are not political. <laughs> um, it's disingenuous. So let's be honest. Everybody's political. Let's be. Let's have a conversation about our politics, right? Um, but I think that the purpose of this space is not to say that we are not political, we are not political, but rather to say that there's a lot of stuff that we don't know. In order to be political, you need to provisionally say, "This is what I think I know," right? But we want to have that part that we know we don't know or we think we don't know, be pertinent, be palpable, and, and we want to force ourselves to pursue that. And I think, I just want to add to that, I think that that, and to go back to what you were saying, I mean, with all, with all due respect, I think that I, I and, you know, maybe others here have learned a lot from the generation that was before us, in that uh, m there are limits to ideology and there are limits to calcifying our politics and our identity and what is included and what is not included and these questions of authentic authenticity and inauthenticity and trying to kind of police those lines um, these are all questions that we are engaged in um, but to actually have a, a sort of a manifesto or like a checklist I think you know is where it gets a little slippery and I think that also that's why I became a poet and not you know, not an activist, you know, or even a, or even a scholar, is because it is all about inquiry and questions. Um. This is what I was actually mentioned uh, and take the question of that. Did you know that uh, the history of Chantay were really created here? No. Happy modernity and other part of the original. And that original editorial board fell apart precisely because of time But you did. But you did. And I'll say this about Saida. Who was asking me for my poems? Who would ask me for my poems? Uh, that she did, you know, and that's what, that was a space for me. So, th no, no, so, no, no. yeah. I'm yeah. About the practices, uh, yeah. The Especially in the Iranian context. 
what is it specific so, to you? So, no, 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 it just, it's, for, for me, it's not a concern. For me, it's just interesting, the challenges. That, and and mm. it's not even, you know, it's, I'm just trying to figure out what the editorial group within themselves, how they discuss this. But what's political, there are some things that are shared. There are some what's called power. There are some things that are shared internationally that is affecting everybody. And then there are some things that are very local, right, obviously. So how this moves when you take something, and it's, 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 um, it seems to be working thus far for you guys, and it's great. I mean, but I know that there's a ton of challenges involved. So, you know, where how you write something here for a particular audience in the U.S. or in Europe is going to be read very differently in Iran. And if you have someone in Iran writing, you know, because the powers that are impacting folks in Iran, oppressing, you can say, or whatever folks in Iran, liberating them, are going to be quite different. So how that moves across, you know, that's, that's tough. That's, that's in front of the audience, right? It's like the, and, and you're saying that you're trying to get all the, the sort of sub-community culture to come together, and it's interesting. If I could say something, um, in, in a different, like, with a different hat, I'm a, I'm a PhD student myself, I do political theory. So it's all about like, if I was giving this kind of a presentation in that form, it would be all about having everything down to a T, ready to anticipate critiques and respond to them. This is, I think, a different kind of project, at least for me, insofar as it's like, I could just like let my hair down and like, just, just do, right? Just put something out there and see what happens. And I think that's, I mean, I, when I'm hearing your, your point, that's what it reminds me of is to the extent to which we just did something. And we're just doing it, and we're figuring it out as we go along. And I think we're really fascinated by what it generates by just doing it. Because I think if I was wearing my like PhD student hat, I don't think I would have ever done this. I would have been too <laughs> terrified. But you're honing your chops in a way, you know, and you're doing things that you couldn't do within that that game, which sure. is very re you know you have to defend you know this is sort of ancient tradition you know that manifests itself, it, and it'll never be comprehensive you know. But as 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 Barth says you know. Do not attempt to be exhaustive. You know, that's liberating. We have time for maybe one more question. Sorry, I, I'm not, that's okay. I, I, I've just been thinking about what you said, about you have to engage in some self censoring Without mincing words, um, Iran is a dictatorship of many sorts. I mean, even though it's, it's not homogeneous in some sense, but it's quite obvious. And from here, when you want to engage audiences there, in the outside, you have a different voice. You write in a different voice, you can say things that you cannot say there. And then they have their own voice that they're trying to say things in a very coded manner. So, I've just been struggling with what you said in the sense that what are those lines? How far are you willing to move the censorship line? <coughs> what, however, um, whatever you call them, in the sense of um, the, the context of it. You know, I don't know exactly. You just gave us one example, but how far are you willing to uh, to go in order to be able to? Uh, connect with people in Iran, and then when people read the stuff that you guys have written under some sort of a an edited version, however mild, um, how would they know that what you're writing is written by your writing? You, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it's not something that has been. I'm not saying you're doing this. I'm just I'm just throwing it out there in the sense of um, what kind of discussions. Um, you guys are having amongst each other in the sense of what these boundaries are and how fluid are they and how far are you willing to begin? Okay, yeah, I mean, should I go? Yeah. Okay, well, I think, you know, we, we tend to say um, from a, if, just to be reductive, from a leftist, leftist kind of perspective that politics is everywhere, so, pol you know, and we grant that, 
But why don't we also say that censorship is everywhere, right? So there's codes here as well. You can make the argument that the mm -hmm. United States is a neoliberal authoritarian country. Mm -hmm. I've seen plenty of people in political science, which is my field of study, make that argument. So then the question is, how do we translate across different codes of censorship, right? So this gets back to the question of translation, right? So translation is invariable. It's everywhere, all the time. You can never get out of it, right? And so then the question becomes, how do you navigate across various codes? Right, um, so I, I think that's the more um, interesting question for us, or, or maybe that's just a different way of reframing reframing your question. I, mean, I have issues with, with what you said, but anyway, I mean, that's, that's great. That's what you. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah.